people. They're ordinary people. They confront extraordinary circumstances uh, from time to time. And while um, we um, are known more for courage, I can tell you very frankly that we are not courageous and we'd rather not be persecuted and be able to take forward our work with, with facilitation rather than all kinds of impediments that we suffer. Um, I also think that this subject that we are going to deal with today uh, on fading democracy and shrinking civic space in South Asia is uh, important for us because it is, as we all will agree, the presence of a strong and vibrant civil society is undeniably a measure to assess the level of democratic progress of any state. I think what our speakers are going to be saying today will show you how the space for civil uh, action is shrinking in every country of South Asia. And human rights defenders, journalists, social activists, academics are confronting a level of restriction on freedom of expression and association in particular that is now threatening the very existence of an active civil society. It is largely through the initiatives taken by the organized civil society, in particular the human rights community, that democracy thrives. While support for human rights and democracy in structures of the state uh, is slow to emerge, or may even have suffered a reversal in many cases uh, in our region, civil society has demonstrated a strong resolve to resist authoritarianism and oppression. Civil society actors have played a significant role in introducing recognition by the state on the concepts of participatory democracy, on adherence to the rule of law, and for the promotion and protection of human rights. It is civil society initiatives that have played a fundamental role in implementing the overall human rights framework. In situations of crisis, it is these actors who monitor, investigate, and report violations and lay the grounds for a measure of accountability and for eliminating impunity. And I must say, and all of us know from our personal experiences that this was not easily done. Human rights defenders have suffered harm and faced grievous threats to their life, liberty, security, independence, and credibility. Uh, state apparatus or oppressive laws and other tools of repression continue to be used against defenders in attempts to deter them from the valuable work they contribute to the promotion of human rights. All over the region, the human rights community continues to be subjected to assassinations, disappearances, illegal arrest and detention, torture. Added to these are vilification campaigns and negative propaganda against the civil society and especially the organized civil society, which has made it so difficult for us to survive in the face of onslaught by the state and the kind of mindsets that are created in the society and the communities about what they very, um, uh, they, they refer to NGOs in a very derogatory um, manner by calling them these NGOs. So, Today, we thought that Sahar, uh, as a regional platform, uh, should now look at this crisis, not just to air our grievances, but also to find a strategy where we can uh, locate the pressure points that will allow us to overcome the repressive state in a manner in which we can, as a society, make progress possible through human rights work, through the work that we do for peace and security, and through our efforts to create institutions where access to justice is possible for all. We have an excellent panel today, and I have uh, the privilege to introduce each of them. And these are people that I think um, I can safely call veterans in the field of human rights. Uh, no offense meant, uh, it's not with regard to their age that I call them veterans, but because of their experience. So um, I would like to first introduce Ms. Indra Jaising. I think 
No one in this gathering um, doesn't know Indra, hasn't been uh, following the work that she has done as a lawyer, as a human rights defender, um, and generally as a thinker on democracy and the rule of law. And I uh, know that, uh, you know, she started her legal practice in the early 1960s. She was the first woman to be designated as senior advocate by the High Court of Bombay. Mm -hmm. Somebody, I think, needs to mute themselves. Indra was also uh, the first woman who was appointed as the additional solicitor general of India in 2009. And I think her current difficulties are really connected uh, to the excellent work that she did as the additional solicitor general. She's one of the founders of the Lawyers Collective, a legal NGO, and has been working since its inception in 1988, no, sorry, 1980, for the rights of the marginalized. Indra has fought and won a number of landmark legal battles and has pioneered in forming landmark laws, such as laws against domestic violence and sexual harassment at the workplace, among other legal interventions that she has successfully made. She represented India in the United Nations on the Committee for the Elimination, elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women from 2009 to 2012. Indra is going to be giving us a, an overview of the broader framework uh, of, of the um, democratic development, how it is linked to fundamental freedoms and where repression occurs, how um, democracy wanes and where freedoms are taken away. Um, Indra is a constitutional lawyer and, and she has not only um, uh, promoted human rights outside of the courts, she has in fact used the judicial forum to promote human rights and to enforce fundamental freedoms. So Indra, please uh, give us your overview and um, I hope that um, everyone can hear her well. So over to you, Indra. Thank you, uh, Hina, for that flattering introduction. But I think you hit the nail on the head when you said that my current problems are very much linked to the fact that I was additional solicitor general during the period 2009 to 2014. But we'll talk about that a little later. Uh, the title of my presentation today, as I said, it's an overview rather than getting into the, uh, you know, micro level, is uh, a state without fundamental rights. Now, I ask the question, can a state exist without fundamental rights? And here's my answer. I'm giving you the answer in a historical context. Legal frameworks by themselves are not adequate to analyze rights including the right to freedom of association. Rights themselves have come to be enshrined in constitutions in post-colonial countries for the first time after they got independence. Hence, the constitution itself is the product of a political process and is primarily a political document. The problem of dissent, of resistance is however, a very, very ancient one. Take, for example, the case of India as an illustration. Please bear with me when I say the state existed in India without the existence of fundamental rights. Because all it entails is a proper system of governance. It is not necessarily linked to rights. Uh, the East India Company had its own state structure in place by which we were governed. And after that, the British Crown under the Government of India acts. Very, very sophisticated, very efficient structures, very efficient states, well-oiled machines. There was no obligation in these states to respect fundamental rights of the people. It is for the first time in 1950 in post-colonial constitutions that this right was introduced as limitations on state power by the people in the form of fundamental rights, to it, of which the right to associate, which we are discussing today, is only one of them. This historical process cannot be forgotten while discussing rights in general. Now, 
we need to understand that the state can exist without the without the guarantee of fundamental rights and i believe it, that is something of what we are seeing today uh, india's constitution was itself influenced by the un charter which in turn influenced a lot of other constitutions of other post colonial states i hope that the theory that the right to life was a gift of the constitution propounded in adm jabalpur is now buried and we are proceeding with this discussion on the understanding that we are born with the natural right to life which no government no state no constitution can take away hina mentioned participatory democracy and so it's necessary to outline some of the indicators of a part participatory democracy democracy itself sets up several institutional arrangements such as uh, the separation of powers uh, the uh, existence of the upper house and the lower house the existence of an independent judiciary autonomy of universities autonomy of the election commission etc etc and yet and these are all institutions of public participation participatory democracy we can petition our mps draft laws must be made available to us for comment committees must be set up in parliament to debate these laws you can't just go to parliament and say this is the law uh, these are some of the forms of participation that we are familiar with and yet when we are confronted with a majoritarian government we are told take it or leave it we are told quote and quote this is the will of the people you have elected us and having elected us you have bargained away your right to protest or your right to disagree with laws that are passed this is the narrative of the authoritarian government that we see in place it is easy for me to give a legal answer and say courts are available to challenge these decisions on the touchstone of the constitution they exist to protect minorities and they are counter majoritarian institutions the problem however is that when democracy fails the courts also fail along with democracy failing because they are after all a creature of democracy so how can we expect courts to survive when democracy itself doesn't survive it's a very serious question we need to ask ourselves you know and you mentioned that throughout my life i have used law as an instrument of social change and i now find myself in this conundrum struggling to find answers what we have then is the illusion of democracy and nothing more than that the question therefore is what are the indications of this failing democracy uh as i said it's not just the existence of uh, the constitution on paper and the importance of voting once in 5 years we therefore uh look at democracy as the right to our to allow our imagination to flourish it is something that enables us to strive to allow people and all creeds of all kinds to flourish individually collectively and therefore the phrase life liberty and pursuit of happiness has meaning for us to achieve this democracy has to be structured in certain ways such as institutional autonomy separation of powers of free press and a flourishing and free civil society civil society has often been called the fifth pillar fifth estate and it is this fifth estate which appears to be shrinking uh with the shrinking of democracy so i don't think that people like us who have devoted all our lives to the defense of human rights should at all be surprised that our uh, spaces uh, for civil society are also shrinking democracy on the other hand is meant to constantly create the need to imagine and it's a romantic kind of imagination which enables us to create a better world and if i may say so to sustain our civilizations what we are seeing today is the decline of civilization itself democracy is not an end in itself but a means to a better life and 
this is the space that human rights defenders occupy the right to imagine a better world. Hence the destruction of these institutions and the quelling of dissent and the subjugation of a free press and the, the, uh, uh, the destroying of the secular fabric are inherently linked with the denial of democracy insofar as it belies the notion of citizenry itself. What we see across South Asia today is a concerning trend that the freedom of association, which includes interlinked rights of free speech, freedom of assembly, uh, which subsumes the right to protest and the right to form associations is under attack, ironically, from demo democratically in elected governments themselves. Let's come to the case of India with which I'm most familiar. The Indian situation is looking more and more bleak. The state apparatus has been actively dismantling the freedom of association through an assault on civil rights organizations, on lawful protesters and on human rights activists. Stringent laws designed to penalize involvement with terrorism related organizations, as well as laws to curtail foreign funding have been let loose on dissenters to the detriment of a robust and wide, vibrant civil space. As the Supreme Court often says, all this has a chilling effect on our freedoms. The use of these laws has been backed by propaganda campaigns. I, I advisedly use the word propaganda. It is propaganda that ultimately leads to hate speech and targeting across the med media houses and social media that vilifies defenders human rights activists and civil rights organizations. These, uh, these are the instruments for dismantling civil space. There are forms and forms of protest and I'm struck by a judgment of the Supreme Court of India with which I disagree. In the Shaheen Bagh case, the Supreme Court tried to distinguish between forms of protest under colonial rule, where they said civil disobedience is justified, and under democratic rule, where they said it is not justified. Uh, I'm afraid it's impossible to agree with this distinction, for one must ask the question, what if the democratic state becomes akin to a colonial state? Do we then not retain the right to civil disobedience as a form of dissent? I'd like to draw attention to a particularly disturbing form of curbing dissent, and that is curbing the internet. More and more, our right to associate and our freedom of speech is moving to online spaces. Let's be very clear about that. Hina herself mentioned that one of the ways in which we can meet each other is this technology, Zoom. So we are moving into the internet space to exercise our right to freedom of speech rather than physically. It includes freedom of speech and expression, association and profession. The speed with which we have moved in this direction has been hastened by the pandemic. The government is exercising excessive control and censorship over the internet without lawful justification. They threaten intermediaries. To my knowledge, I know that intermediary service providers are threatened with prosecution if they do not cooperate with, uh, with, with the government. An entire state and its population are being denied the use of the internet by losing, uh, you know, by losing out on the use of the internet. It is really a denial of their civil right to associate, to speak. Let's, let's call it what it is. Elections are now being fought online with zero accountability to the election commissions of India and its oversight. In the name of the pandemic, restrictions on freedom of movement have been imposed on workers which are unbelievable and unjustified. The use of facial recognition software to make arrests make a nonsense of criminal law and due process of law. Basic rules of evidence are being given a complete go by making a mockery of procedure established by law, by unproven software, by unproven technological software. Uh, the report of Citizens Lab, for example, along with Amnesty recently provides a very frightening, frightening picture, uh, proof enough of the fact that human rights defenders were targeted by malware. And I think this is continuing in many, many different forums against civil rights defenders. Let me turn to a few words about the secular state. 
is distinguished to, it is important to distinguish at least in theory between a secular and a theocratic state. In a secular country, there is no room for something like blasphemy, for example. And therefore India statute books do not contain the offense of blasphemy. What we see, however, is the creeping dismantling of secularism through the back door. First through propaganda and false news by trolls, demonizing minorities. And now I must say, all human rights defenders are the new minorities, at least in my country. And then through legislation without changing the text of the constitution. Every dem democratic institution has been hollowed out from within. Autonomy of institutions and universities has been taken away. There is no transparency in election funding. What we call the Godi media, and most importantly, ostensible use of law to achieve illegal ends. Let me give you just a few examples. The Aadhaar Act was passed as a money bill, bypassing the Rajya Sabha only because they wanted to avoid the scrutiny of an upper house where they had no majority. Let me give you another most shocking example. The Prevention of Money Laundering Act was passed as a money bill. What would you say to a criminal law being passed as a money bill? Again, only to avoid scrutiny by the upper house. A critical appointment of a public servant, the director of the enforcement direct directorate has been retrospectively amended as if a presidential order issued two years ago can be amended two years later. But then the man who gets the extension as the enforcement director is the man who is needed to target human rights defenders. The Lawyers Collective, which was founded way back in 1981, as Hina pointed out, has received a summons to appear before the Enforcement Directorate under the Prevention of Money Laundering Act for alleged violations of FCRA. Such are the devastating ways in which human rights defenders are being crushed by new laws made by parliament. Peaceful protesters against CAA have been roped in for having created and conspired to bring about the Delhi riots. The idea is to change the narrative against dissenters, to call them crooks, cheats, money launderers, foreign funded organizations, and unlawful activities, to create hatred in the public mind against them. Fake news and hate speech are used to create a demon in the public mind, putting us on the back foot defending ourselves. And finally, of course, we are called anti-national. I need to point out to you that the word anti-national does not exist as a crime in the Indian Penal Code. It appeared in the Defense of India Act rules in 1962 uh, to deal with a war and external aggression. After all, the nation is defined in international law as a territorial unit. It is nothing more than a territorial concept devoid of all patriotic or moral overtones. Uh, now, just I'll end by talking about a few laws which are used. There is, of course, the law of sedition. People have critiqued this saying, well, sedition should only be an offense if it's accompanied by violence. I think we miss the point. The point is no government in under a democracy can demand that we do not have quote unquote disaffection for its policies. Enacted at a time when we were a subject population, sedition cannot survive constitutional scrutiny, not because it is not accompanied by violence, but because it has no business to exist at all. And therefore, we must call for its immediate repeal. Sedition is not a crime against the nation. Under colonial rule, it was a crime against the government. But our government conflates government and nation. Then we come to the UAPA, Prevention of Unlawful Activities Act. And here, I think what is of greatest significance is that so-called front organizations are also to be banned. There is no definition of what is a front organization. We sitting over here discussing this subject can easily be called a front organization of a band organization. Indra, can have, I ask you to, to wrap up? Yes, sure. We have been called urban nuptials, and I think this is the other issue that we need to take. FCRA, I've already mentioned, I won't go into greater detail, but only to tell you that FCRA targets 
what they call political activity. And we at the Lawyers Collective were uh, accused of indulging in political activity when we lobbied with MPs to pass the Domestic Violence Act and when we lobbied with them to pass the anti-discrimination law for HIV. I'd like to end by saying that the place of rights and a nation governed by the rule of law seems to have disappeared. What we are seeing is the bypassing of the rule of law and the abuse of the process of law. I really don't have uh, any ready-made solutions for this and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Hina, for this opportunity to say a few words. Thank you, uh, Indra, you had us spellbound by uh, what you were saying. Um, but what struck me most in this uh, depressing time is your words, um, imagine a better world. And um, well, we go on trying to imagine one, but we have to keep confronting the realities of these dark days as well. Now it's my privilege to uh, introduce um, my friend, Mohammed Taisin. He's not just a friend, he's also a partner in many crimes that we have commonly and uh, together committed um, over the years. At Tessin uh, is, uh, is founding director of South Asia Partnership, uh, which is a leading NGO in Pakistan. He's a strong believer in civil liberties and is known for his cross grassroots advocacy work. He's also a founding member and secretary of Pakistan NGO Forum, a national representative body of NGOs in Pakistan. He has played a pivotal role in bringing trade unions, media organizations, peasant movements and civil society organizations together at national forums. In addition to serving Sahar as a bureau member, Tehseen has also served as chairperson for a number of human rights organizations, including the Pakistan National Committee of IUCN and the Build, uh, Building Bridges Project of Forum International de Montreal. Now, um, Tessin, um, you have experience of both managing uh, an NGO and being part of many national and regional human rights defenders uh, platforms. Describe to us the social and political environment in which these defenders carry out their work in Pakistan. How have human rights defenders and the human rights uh, community dealt with the threats to them personally and to their activities, both from the state and non-state actors? Over to you, Taisi. Thank you very much, Hina, uh, uh, for a strange introduction, but thank you. And uh, th I mean, thank you, Diksha and friends at Sahar for providing this opportunity of seeing so many old and new friends. Uh, well, I started uh, this, uh, when we started this conversation or program, I, I was feeling very happy. But uh, said, I mean, unfortunately, the situation which has been elaborated upon very, very eloquently by Indra Jai Singh Sahiba, uh, saying about India has really saddened me to the core because, you know, we used to be like you. I mean, it reminds me of Famida Riyaz saying, late Famida Riyaz saying, Ke hamare jaise nikle, you are like us. Uh, but anyway, I think uh, uh, being a born optimist, I would say we with little efforts, we can really make a lot of difference. Let me quickly uh, begin my presentation. I would certainly uh, talk most about the question which Hena has posed, but I somehow have a problem with if, if I... I'm afraid we seem to have lost the scene there. Um, the scene, uh, can you hear us? Okay, he's back on. Okay, thank you. So I think talking um, about violation and talking about um, uh, fascism, the kind of uh, situation we live in, in in this country and generally other parts of South Asia uh, is good, but, but, but let me begin. Uh, really, you know, sharing the kind of a situation we are faced with so that we really understand the enormity of the issue. Uh, just quickly telling you, I'll start with what happened uh, about a week back. 
with, uh, I mean, students marching, uh, students uh, solidarity march in Lahore, uh, where they were demanding their right to unionization and, uh, you know, asking about reasonable fees and scholarships, etc. And one of the organizers, Dr. Marjan, young Harvard graduate in political science and history, uh, I mean, right after the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, he was with us and um, uh, he, suddenly we learned that the, he has been, uh, the deputy commissioner of Lahore has uh, issued an order of his arrest and detention in the court Lakhpur jail for 30 days under maintenance of public order. I mean, three ampere. I mean, imagine the use of such a colonial law and in this kind of a situation and that too against a very highly peaceful intellectual young man who was, I mean, in, in, in that, in that um, order, the DC has said that he has learned that he is a symbol of fear for the society and he's a potential danger for the public peace law and order. Thank God. Uh, he, he had friends like Hina and Salman Raja and Asad Jamal and somehow all of us succeeded um, the, after uh, two days. Uh, they didn't get him arrested and from the high court we got, the, got him out. Now the point I'm making is that, you know, if we're living under such a state where a young intellectual educated boy genuinely believing in peace, asking for the right to unionization can be declared a state terrorist, a, a, a a kind of a fear for the state of Pakistan that speaks volumes of my optimism that if we speak up and we be counted, I'm sure we'll go on. Let me take another one or two minutes about the general situation, not but particularly what has happened in the last only five, you know, eight months, where five thousand journalists has had been laid laid out of their jobs. I mean, they were the ones who, either them or some of them, they were the only independent voices or saner voices in the media. Their media houses, we have, we have cut down their staff. I mean, Dawn, Geo, name anything. I mean, so if 5,000 journalists have lost their jobs, you can imagine the kind of fear it, had been, it has been created in our society. And generally, there is unfortunately a lot of now, you know, self-censorship, uh, uh, which you find among some of the good journalists as well who are talking about it. Uh, journalists are, are kidnapped. Matiullah Jan case was there. He was kidnapped, but he was very fortunate that he came back. But there are many who are still, we don't know, in the last one week, only five journalists from Karachi has been kidnapped. I mean, so at the same time, look at the, I mean, our Islamic, uh, Islamic extremist groups. I mean, talking about Tariq al -Labbaq. I mean, they are free to do whatever they want to. And I mean, I mean, they, they still, I, I mean, they're still uh, using religion and national security. If all of us have been declared anti-state. I was, I mean, declared anti-state. I mean, this goes on. on. I mean, the way military intelligence and other intelligence agencies, with whom you, I usually call the most unintelligent intelligence agencies in this country, I mean, the way they're glaringly breaching the constitutional guarantees and indiscriminate use of force and harassing people. I mean, that's a very unfortunate situation. Civil liberties still in Pakistan, frankly, uh, is a dream with huge negative consequences if you take certain positions. Uh, I mean, missing persons in Balochistan or Sin was a no-go area once upon a time. So I don't know, frankly, where this will lead us to in a country like Pakistan. Uh, journalists, bloggers, NGOs, I mean, NGO, as Indraji said, uh, is a, almost a, has become a bad word. Good old days, we were called communists, and you know, everybody would, would think that we, they are bad people now. NGOs has become, and the kind of laws they are bringing to, you know, uh, really, uh, uh, you know, hold us through the, um, by the, as they came, Gala Ghontna. So the, the Charities Acts, which they brought in the four, all four provinces, where uh, you are, you know, you, you, you need, you are asked by the intelligence agencies, they will tell you what to do in this country. I mean, without that, you cannot move. Coupled with that, another very important uh, uh, dimension in Pakistan, and that is Financial Action Task Force. I mean, I had never heard this, uh, learned, I mean, heard this word, money laundering and terror financing. I mean, it has become a talk of the town. 
and every NGO is looked I mean looked with this and uh, with this eye by the state that they are either involved in money laundering or they are involved in terror financing as if you know anti pakistan anti state pro india was not enough now you are involved into money lending and the way, uh, laundering and the way they look at you so i mean this is the kind of a you know specific sad situation however addressing uh, hina's uh, question which i think is very very important uh, to learn and i mean to work on see the generally environment is of course created by the government's policies and uh, by the inter intelligence agencies is really really harassing it's very fearful whatever little we had gained in the last 30 years in terms of people you know civil spaces speaking out i mean they've taken away everything coupled with that a large number of people they are they are genuinely afraid of talking uh human rights workers or human rights community or human uh, rights defenders uh they are generally considered anti state and uh, of course uh because they pick up very unpopular issues i would say i mean i hate to make any comparison but frankly i think we pakistanis uh, human rights defenders the human rights community we are much more resilient uh compared to any other in south asia because we have ironically we have lived under martial laws and we have we have really faced and fought with those dictatorial regimes one way or another therefore uh uh to answer hina's question therefore that we know how to deal with it i mean pretty resilient we are i'm not saying we're very brave but yes we are pretty used to it we were probably the ones who stand up and say look look what now pakistan pakistan democratic movement is now saying which we've been saying for the last 30 40 years that army has no role in politics we want to live under peace which is our fundamental right to live in a peace and especially with 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 our neighbors so i think consistently demanding respect of the constitution adherence to fundamental rights enshrined in the constitution etc etc i mean i feel very good when now nawaz sharif talks about the thing which we used to say and we would uh, we considered as anti state so things are frankly uh, so i'm i'm not saying that everybody all of us uh, should live under martial laws to learn this kind of stance another important point is the position that you know how how, how to go about it that in terms of how do how do we operate the question in opposed that you know what kind of problems are we facing or what kinds of from state and non state actors i tell you enormous the very the very existence of us and let me put it positively also this is the, this is the way we are we are made of i mean we really somehow we we met in the sense that you know powers to be they to a certain level they are a bit scared of us too i mean because of the principal position we take uh how to i mean especially at the you know isolated deprived districts of pakistan frankly i don't think of the, there's any district now where we do not have human rights defenders where if there's any problem i mean unfortunate incidents of rape with a girl i mean everyone speaks now so these are the kind of things which frankly uh, give me uh this this kind of a feeling to you know how do we how do we deal with the situation i remember and I, even now uh uh one personally uh, sees that you know state and non state actors uh somewhere there is a kind of an acceptance uh, in our society that you know these are the i mean people and human rights defenders they they really mean business and they take principal positions uh we had a meeting with pdm uh, leadership today and i was there in fact she was moderating the meeting there uh where i mean they agreed with whatever we said and said probably they learned from us uh coming back to my last point that since uh, uh see what we have successfully done in the last many years is that we have created friends in every part of the country and out of those friends there are a large number of them who 
pick up those issues which used to be taboo, taboos in our society. The, for instance, I mean, now there is a kind of an agreement that we need democracy. For instance, that there is a kind of an agreement that the military should not uh, interfere in the, in, the, in, uh, in the politics of Pakistan. There is a kind of an agreement and, you know, understanding that parliamentary democracy is one of the best at the moment and we don't have any other uh, example. I personally think that um, going, I mean, not supporting each other, that is another important uh, uh, way to deal with this, uh, the, the onslaught of state and non-state state actors in Pakistan, that has really helped. And wherever we have uh, reached, uh, reached out to the, uh, to the court of law, that has also helped us a lot. Uh, we still need to work together. We need to learn how to work together in alliance building, which is important uh, for the human rights defenders and human rights community. And again, going out of the terminology of only human rights or development rights or others, but basically helping each other, that will uh, help us a lot in the near future. I think this is the time that we must strive hard to have these kinds of meetings and have our regional um, solidarity and nice building at the regional level, that would certainly help uh, in, 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 in confronting or in engaging and in dealing with the state authorities and state bad laws. Thank you very much. Thank you, Uthaseen. Um, <clears throat> a bit of uh, advice for everybody. Please don't envy us for our ability uh, of uh, becoming um, more street smart because of having lived under martial law. Yes, it's true that there, this is one um, uh, advantage we gained by navigating these uh, uh, pathways of repression. I now have uh, the pleasure of introducing Brinda Grover, one of our relatively younger human rights defenders and lawyers, and we pin a lot of hope on her. Brinda is, a, uh, as I said, a lawyer and a researcher and a human rights activist. She specializes also, uh, like Indira, in constitutional law, criminal law, and human rights. Uh, she has, of course, uh, appeared and won several landmark cases. She played a key role in 2012 in campaigning for amendments of criminal laws relating to sexual violence against women, which led to the passing of the Criminal Law Amendment Act of 2013 in India. Uh, Time magazine identified Brinda Grover as one of the 100 most influential people in the world in, two, in 2013. Brinda, work your magic on this region as well. For you, my question is, despite the adoption of national constitutions and strong guarantees of protection of fundamental freedoms and, and the creation of independent human rights institutions in South Asian countries, there are visible signs of reversal of the initial advancements. Space for civil society to defend rights seems to have shrunk. You have used courts to challenge state restrictions on civil society organizations or actions against individual human rights defenders to curb the freedom of expression, association, or assembly. How would you assess the role of the courts in enforcing human rights? And also, please give us some idea of you know, whether national human rights institutions have, play, have, have played an effective role in protecting civil society space against invasion through uh, authoritarianism or intrusive actions by the state. So over to you, Brinda. Uh, uh, yes. Thank you, Hina. And uh, I, uh, I think we will have to underline the point about relatively young, because we definitely need more younger people in our midst very soon. Um, and thank you to Seher. I've long been associated and a member of Seher, and it's, uh, to my mind, the most valuable regional platform that we have, both for us to be able to express solidarity in times of uh, trouble, as well as uh, keep alive the vision that Radhika uh, Kumaraswamy again underscored for us of a very different South Asia with which uh, um, Seher was born. Um, my, uh, uh, to respond to the uh, question that Hina has posed, 
I think the context and the, the, the snapshot that uh, Indira Jai Singh has given us actually provides a very valuable space for us to understand what is happening in India. And that's an extremely comprehensive uh, contextualization that Indra has already done for us in so far as India is concerned. So I will try and take that a little further. I first want to begin with a slightly macro point before I get into the, uh, the micro of the institutions that why is there an attack on human rights defenders and NGOs and whether this is to be seen as an attack on as is, as is called very often, particularly in the UN language and in Western democracies about downs, uh, a shrinking of civil society space. Or is it actually particularly in the context of South Asia, the attack and assault is actually on democracy itself as has been alluded to by the earlier speakers also. And in that assault on democracy, and while terms like hollowing out of democracy, illiberal democracy, down backsliding of democracy are terms that have actually picked up much more currency post say uh, uh, Western democracies uh, meeting this kind of fate. I think in South Asia uh, from, from experience that has already, some of which has already come before us today, uh, this kind of uh, hollowing out of the democracy and keeping just the farcical notions of the institutions jostling with each other was already being experienced. And therefore, I would like to locate the attack on human rights defenders and NGOs and social movements and civil society activists very much as at the core of the attack on democracy itself that we are uh, uh, witnessing today. Which brings us to the question of why the attack is so pointed and sharp today at human rights defenders, NGOs, and social justice movements, which uh, of different kinds in different locations. Uh, and the demonization and criminalization of them, which has been referred to both by Hina, uh, Tehseen, and Indra, uh, as to why that plays a very important part has already been discussed. It takes on different manifestations, as was already said through FCRA, et cetera. But I think what is important here is also to link it to the rise of right-wing authoritarian regimes and the impact that is happening on different institutions. Uh, when it comes to the national, and I think in India, we can definitely say, and that is really the way India projects itself at all international fora, and in fact, is bidding for a, a seat at the global high table on uh, using the phrase and actually you could almost, uh, it's, it's uh, uh, I can see uh, friends like Henry are here when India is presenting anything at the UN, I think what is very amusing is if you count the number of time it calls itself the largest democracy and how the constitution and particularly chapter three, the fundamental rights part of the constitution is used, used as a shield by the government at all UN forums. Of course, we know there is a very different uh, 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 way in which this is read and interpreted when it comes uh, uh, to the domestic situation in India. So we do have uh, from the outside visible the Na a National Human Rights Commission, state human rights commissions. We've just got a judgment out of the Supreme Court actually di directing human rights courts everywhere. So the, the pieces of the puzzle, so to say, are there, but the puzzle is no longer fitting together because most of the pieces are either distorted or uh, muted. If I begin with the National Human Rights Commission itself, which has in our, uh, at different points, difficult different points of our democracy, if we were to take the issue of 2002, when there was uh, a genocidal attack on Muslims in the state of Gujarat, uh, we saw the NHRC rise to the occasion and uh, step in both in the Supreme Court and on the ground on behalf of victims who could not find any space to, uh, to represent themselves. That NHRC and the NHRC of today are almost in, unrecognizable. In the face of innumerable assaults, we see the NHRC following procedures. And it's quite fascinating because as there are many human, I mean, everybody here is a human rights defender and activist, but also many human rights lawyers. As human rights lawyers, we have always um, center staged procedural rights, process, 
and said, it is these procedural rights which give, the, uh, give life to human rights, substantive human rights. However, what we see today is how procedural rights can also become farcical. As the NHRC goes through motions of issuing notice, taking replies, and closing files. So there is an HRD nodal center in the NHRC, which does take, you can file a complaint, the complaint will have a complaint number on the website for sure. But the process has become the farce where the process does not yield to any independent accountability inquiry or investigation by, uh, of the state by the institution. And we just, uh, we see that this, these uh, this, these particular institutions have almost become the shield to use again for by the state to use against criticisms, whether domestic or global, and then to use them further. And this is where I would locate the court also to then use that to legitimize what is happening, saying they have not say, uh, made any pronouncement. And uh, uh, that is really the manner in which we see the, the institutions like NHRC having dwindled and diluted itself to the most formalistic of approach towards human rights at a time when there is an urgent need for a resurrection of both the letter and spirit of human rights. Coming to uh, the courts, and we can't put all the courts in a monolith, we know we have high courts across every state uh, uh, and we have different responses. In fact, some would be more responsive than even the apex court. The Supreme Court, the apex court has come in for trenchant criticism not only by human rights groups and activists and lawyers, but also by former members of the, of the higher judiciary. Uh, to take pluck one phrase that was recently used by a former uh, justice to say there is a flicker of hope. So we see these occasional spurts of hope uh, from the court where while granting bail to a particular citizen, uh, very profoundly the right to freedom of speech and expression, the, right, the, the core values of uh, freedom and the tyranny of the state are articulated in words that, would, uh, uh, that ought to revive hope. However, because it is a flicker, because it is occasional, and because we are not seeing an institutional response, there is cause for extreme concern and anxiety. What is happening today is that across the board, both in human rights commissions and in the court, we are seeing individual responses rather than institutional responses. And as uh, Indra very right, rightly pointed out, that surely the court is this, particularly the higher uh, uh, apex court is not going to exist in the, in the abstract. But what we find is that it is extremely accommodating of state views and state concerns. And here I will take the example of Kashmir actually. And I think for too long, Indian civil society, Indian, uh, 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 progressives, HR, uh, human rights defenders have allowed Kashmir to be treated as the state of exception that the Indian state wanted it to be treated as. And uh, uh, what we see today is that that state of exception is no longer going to be uh, um, demarcated by the boundary of the state and its it's uh, uh, the manner in which the state has dealt with people there is today has crept into across the board uh, in, in different parts of the country. Um, I will take the example here of the Anuradha Basin case, which were on behalf of an editor and Anuradha Basin is well known to many people in South Asia as the editor of Kashmir Times and one of our foremost human rights defenders. Uh, and we filed this case on the ground of freedom of speech and expression and the internet lockdown that uh, Indra referred to as one of our most critical human rights of today. Uh, a long period of absolute communication shutdown is allowed and permitted and till the court takes it up, which only comes uh, up somewhere uh, uh, for three, four months down the line, even for uh, for the court to hear. And that in itself uh, is an indicator of what is the significance being attached to when an entire population of a state is, uh, is deprived of any form of communication. Uh, you have habeas corpus petitions pending. There cannot be a more urgent 
uh, right than the right to habeas corpus, where again we see the court taking a long time. It's, it is, and during that period, the state actually consolidates the narrative. The silence of the court is then used to the advantage of consolidating the narrative of demonizing entire groups and the national security concerns of our take paramount to fundamental rights. So it is often not just what the court does, but rather what the, the omissions and the silences of the court, which actually facilitate a certain kind of state narrative to take center stage. Uh, similarly with journalists, the kind of crackdown that we have seen of journalists in Kashmir is today being witnessed across the country. And uh, whether it is a human rights defender or a journalist, the charge of sedition, the charge of being uh, uh, anti-state or anti-national is rather casually and easily imposed. Here I want to just point one thing in particular. Uh, Indra referred to uh, the term anti-national. Actually, the term anti-national makes uh, resurfaces in independent India in the 42nd amendment passed during the emergency imposed by uh, the Indira Gandhi government, which this particular present BJP government has always held that that was the darkest period of Indian democracy. And uh, uh, many of them claim that they are all that they have, uh, uh, you know, uh, they were the opposed. They were the ones who opposed the national emergency. It's so interesting that the Forty Second Amendment, uh, which introduced and the term anti-national activity and anti-national associations, and tried to place them beyond the scrutiny of fundamental rights uh, or any law, uh, uh, any law imposed upon such associations beyond the scrutiny of fundamental rights, fortunately repealed immediately by the 40, uh, 3rd, 44th Amendment with the coming in of the Janta Party. However, that term today has been resurrected by this government. Of course, it has no legal uh, uh, roots anymore, or, uh, or, but it is a term that is very easily, casually used from the, uh, a TV uh, forum to the street to unfortunately in uh, police uh, 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 information reports, complaints, as well as the courtroom. Why does that become uh, important to see? And I want to refer here to two, three things, and I will closely, I, I think I'll be running out of my time, so I'm going to uh, wind up. We see very important movements coming up, challenging outside the court. And it is these movements which actually provide the, the hope, not just within the country, but across the region, of how to challenge this kind of authoritarianism and the swing towards regressive uh, 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 right-wing uh, uh, politics, which, which today is increasingly uh, becoming the common sense. We had uh, a very strong movement, a peaceful, popular, democratic uh, movement against the CEA, particularly in Delhi with women and young people leading uh, the peaceful pro uh, uh, protests and the constitution and the preamble, the symbols and motifs of those movements. Uh, as, as has already been mentioned, that entire uh, pr uh, protest has now been criminalized, demonized, and has been uh, the leaders of those movements, many of them very young leaders and really uh, uh, have been put away behind bars. Similarly, we know some of our uh, most important human rights defenders fighting particularly for the marginalized and vulnerable, including indigenous populations, which is where the corporates need to go. And these are the frontline defenders who have to be removed. And the prisons have today become the holding place for human rights defenders against right-wing authoritarianism, as well as the private sector and corporates who want to make a free go at resources, natural resources, over which indigenous populations, Adivasis, have a first claim, even under the constitution. Um, we, we need to- uh, I'll, I'll just, I'm just ending with, uh, with two more sentences. I think we need to look at the law today as having become 
the weapon of choice. The law today is no longer the enabler of human rights. The law has become the weapon of choice of states to because it carries with it the, the, the charade of, of legality, which is then projected. And while all of us can understand that most of these cases will not lead to, uh, uh, will not, should not withstand any legal or judicial scrutiny, what they will do is that they will have not only put away human right defenders, delegitimize them, but also have a silencing and chilling effect. The farmers movement going on today as we speak, particularly in Delhi, which have refused to accept any designated space as mandated by the Supreme Court for public protest, but have taken, have, have asked for certain laws to be repealed. I think it's important to make the linkages between human rights defenders, NGOs, and larger movements. And it is through these movements that we will be able to uh, 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 rescue and retrieve the democracy that we wish to see in South Asia. Thank you very much. Thank you, Virinda. <clears throat> I'm afraid we are running really very short of time now. And we have three very uh, eminent uh, speakers uh, who we really want to hear. Um, my next, um, uh, the next speech, uh, speaker we have is uh, this brave woman called uh, Shireen Saroor who has been working with grassroots movements in the most difficult terrains and the most difficult uh, climate to get justice for people at the grassroots level. Uh, Shireen is um, a peace activist. Uh, she's a women's rights activist. She founded the Manar Women's Development Fund in Manar, uh, which, was, which is her war-affected hometown in the Northwest of Sri Lanka in 1998. She used its links to bring together women's groups and co-founded the Women's Action Network. Shirin has won many awards for her activism, including the Women Peacemaker Fellowship and several other awards. Now, in her work as a woman human rights defender, bringing justice to the grassroots level workers, human rights defenders, and the population in general. My question to you, Shirin, is, you know, women human rights defenders do play a very strong role in defending the rights of the most marginalized and vulnerable communities, especially those who are protect, protecting uh, social and economic rights. It is also true that it is the women human rights defenders who face the most difficult challenges from social structures and economic interests. And, um, you know, they are targeted by various social and private actors in addition to the state. Um, and those private actors include religious groups and community and tribal elders and even members of their own family. So my question to you is, what are the particular risks that women human rights defenders take in getting justice for people? And how far do state institutions and governments fulfill their responsibility to protect women human rights defenders against these threats from both state and non-state actors? Over to you, uh, Shireen. Thank you, Hina. <laughs> Thank you very much for Sahar team. Um, actually, usually I'm very uh, vocal and I can talk about uh, women human rights defenders uh, individually and because my sisters are suffering a lot and right now the movement that uh, you talked about women's action network is closed uh, but I will make a more general presentation because this forum is open that itself should indicate to you all where we are in Sri Lanka as women human rights defenders Uh, women human rights defenders are targeted even in times of relevant uh, relative peace for their gender, the work they do, spaces they occupy, and what they represent. In conflict context, these tensions are amplified and women human rights defenders become a target for both state and non-state actors. To me, at this point of time, women include all persons identified as women and conflict is not limited to armed conflict. As we know, many of our conflicts are revolving and we women keep whistleblowing of conflict within conflict and within communities. At the extent of risk, 
is worse when it intersect with other identities of women defenders like their ethnicity, religion, location, class, language, sexual orientation. Many women activists in these contexts are from survivors community. Human rights, human rights, justice and truth are not option to these women human rights defenders, but a must and perceived as essential to the survival of her, her family and the communities that she represents. Oftentimes, they do not come into this work as professionals, but as survivors or sometimes forced into it. Their work, commitment, and the risk that they take are linked to their connection to the communities that they represent and the atrocities that they have personally suffered. In many contexts, women take the lead in organizing protests and building movement for justice. Apart from the physical violence, especially coming from the state, we need to also understand the structural imbalances and the very patriarchy that they have to fight within and outside the movement and communities which undermines their brave and frontline work and struggle. The state perceives the women, the women defenders work as a direct and dangerous challenge to the narrative that most states governments present on conflict situation and their conduct. The grassroots defenders represent not only their own land in case of land grab or their missing children or the family members that they are looking for, but their struggle also extend to the crisis faced by others in the context of shrinking spaces and increasing state aggressions. Due to their links in the community, women human rights defenders are specially capable of documenting, recording, testifying, and passing on sensitive information that the government seeks to deny their presence at a protest, campaign, movement, reports, or document is powerful counter. And for that same reason, they become a target. As you all know, conflict challenges ingrain certain repressive practices, including violence against women. It becomes more risky to speak out against violence in your own community, especially when there is culture of impunity. Women addressing these issues who live and work in their same community are especially vulnerable to attack from inside. Good example from Sri Lanka is Muslim women who are trying to articulate Muslim personal law reform at the same time when Sri Lankan gov current government is anti-Muslim and they have brought in policies like compulsory cremation. Indian women who are fighting against Citizenship Act while addressing female genital mutilation in their own community. Pakistani sisters who are fighting against blasphemy law to safeguard their Christian sisters' rights and Bangladeshi women defending their Hindu sisters' rights or women who are working to secure sex workers or LGBTQ rights. Oftentimes, the attacks on them are multiple and grave. Sexual violence in a conflict context can be used in multiple ways including reprisal against men and women. For women, the nature of violence, context, source, prevalence is deeply linked to their gender identity. Sexual violence in conflict and the threat of such violence, its impact on women's ability to work, feel safe and live with dignity is well documented. The danger is not to combine or summarize all women's experience in conflict to to being raped or having lost their male family members. Grassroots women defenders sometimes do not want to be seen only as victims, but as change agents in demanding justice for communities. Their experiences are so rich, much more than their male counterpart. With pandemic and new technology, there is increasing online violence and threat and oftentimes it manifests as sexualized attack against women human rights defenders. Besides, women human rights defenders are faced with violence and threat against their family members, which quite often impact gravely the, the woman herself because of her gender. Thus, oftentimes, the safety measures involve complex consideration, not only of her own safety, but that of her family, especially her children, spouse, colleagues, and extended family members. Uh, Hina, your question with regarding state across the broad 
uh, spectrum i just looked at it i can't find any example state and non state actors have failed time and time again adequately protect women human rights defenders including un security council resolution 1325 has miserably failed in an i mean in an extreme example the government sri lankan government would actively target human rights defenders particularly ground level women put them in direct danger including of vigilante violence in sri lanka it is happening to the mothers of disappeared only war related movement struggle, struggle left uh, today in this country however even in the context where there are public commitment to protect human rights defenders like pakistan and uh, afghanistan or in governments which are which are seen as better democracy democracy such as nepal women human rights defenders continue to be targeted with impunity other south asian countries are much worse and i am speaking from one of such country thank you very much Thank you, Shireen, for this very um, well and very precise uh, picture that you have drawn of the kind of um, uh, di difficulties that women human rights defenders um, face, in addition to those that they face as human rights defenders in general. So, um, um, you know, and, and it's it's not, and it's it's great that you mentioned that everywhere the plight seems to be the same. It's not only in one country. Our next speaker is um, again uh, a very well-known um, uh, personality in the whole of South Asia. Dr. Saravana Muttu uh, is the founder executive director of, of the Center for Policy Alternatives, which is a civil society organization that works to, to strengthen institutions and capacity building for good governance and conflict transformation in Sri Lanka. He has written uh, extensively on governance and peace issues in Sri Lanka. He was um, uh, invited by President Obama in 2013 uh, to attend his high level event on civil society. Dr. Saravana Muttu uh, is a member of the Foreign Policy Advisory Group, uh, and he is also recipient of the uh, Citizens Peace Award by the National Peace Council of Sri Lanka in 2010. Dr. Saravana Muttu, I just wanted to pose this question to you about the rise in excessive nationalism and religious extremism uh, in the region, which has become a cause of serious human rights violations by both state and non-state actors. Human rights defenders, lawyers, journalists, writers, and many others have been in the front line to defend individuals and communities against violence, against persecution, discrimination, social exclusion, and prosecution under laws related to security, sedition, et cetera. How is the safety of human rights defenders affected by these trends in Sri Lanka? Dr. Muthu, the doctor. Thank you, Hina. Thank you, Sahar, for giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts with you. The short answer to your question is, is that the government of the day has created the enabling environment in which human rights defenders are put on the spot. And therefore, it's only those who dare to come out and with a little bit of luck may get away with it. But otherwise, they have to practice a certain amount of self-censorship and a certain amount of restraint. Now, why is that? Why is the government of the day providing an enabling environment of this kind? I think it's largely because, you know, in Sri Lanka, we have the single Buddhist majority, which is roughly what, 75% of the population. We've defeated Tamil extremism or Tamil terrorism, as the government likes to say, in 2009 with the defeat of the LTTE. So now we have the Muslim community. And it's no surprise that since 2009, there have been more clashes between the singular majority community and the Muslim community. And this, of course, was compounded by the Easter Sunday bombings, which were attributed to Muslim extremists in Sri Lanka. Now, the point I think that needs to be made is, is that this goes much deeper in that the notion of the majority identity is also a notion of victimization. And that is this notion that, look, 
Although the Sinhalese Buddhists are the majority in Sri Lanka, they have nevertheless been victimized by the colonial powers and subsequently too. There are Tamils in South India and in the rest of South Asia. There are Muslims all around the world, but there are only Sinhalese in Sri Lanka. And therefore they should be given preference. They have, as one president put it, they have the spoon and therefore they will serve the food to everyone else. So it stems from this notion that they have been put under siege, that they are a besieged, vulnerable population. And indeed, the Rajapaksas have capitalized on this for a long, long time. And it is the ultimate uh, secret, if you like, of their success to capitalize upon the sense of discrimination that the singular community feels as far as the future is concerned. All the problems with regard to globalization, all the problems with regard to having to deal with two communities that have a lot of industry, a lot of enterprise, who contributed a tremendous amount to the well being and welfare of the country, all of that has now come home to roost in terms of a very singular majoritarian regime that has come to power. The Rajapaksa presidential election campaign, as well as the Rajapaksa campaign in terms of the general election, both of them were conducted through a network of Buddhist temples throughout the country. And therefore, it was very difficult for anyone to resist it or to contest it because, as you know, as far as the rural areas of the country is concerned, the temple is the very hub of social activity. So in a, a situation in which the opposition is seen as westernized, as deracinated, as being alien, this whole notion of the singular Buddhist uh, dominance and the assertion of that identity is done at the expense of the minority community. When Mahindra Rajapaksa was president, you had the link between what you call the Bodhu Balasena, a chief uh, right-wing Buddhist organization in Sri Lanka, and for example, Viratu's 969 movement. The head of the Bodhu Balasena is a, a priest called Venerable Dalabuddha Arte Nyanasara. He has been charged with contempt of court when he was intimidating uh, Mrs. Eknaligoda, Sandhya Eknaligoda, the wife of the missing journalist in Sri Lanka. Now, the interesting thing, of course, was is that he was got on contempt of court, whereas he's been spewing hate speech all over the country against the Muslims in particular for quite some time, but the government refused to use the ICCPR law that we have. Likewise, for example, we have a young lawyer, Hejaz Hezbollah, who is in jail for quite some time under detention, hasn't brought, been brought before a court. Again, the ICCPR law being used. So what we have, therefore, at the present moment is a situation in which the majority community is asserting its identity asserting that they are the masters, if you like, of the country and that everyone else has to accept and capitulate to that notion. So Sri Lanka as a country made up of many peoples, as a country made up on the basis of unity in diversity, that is being shredded and thrown away. If this continues, this is going to be a majoritarian country in which the minorities would have to put up or shut up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Saravanamuttu. Um, I think what you have said really uh, sends, a make, you know, it, it has a chilling effect on everyone listening uh, today to uh, what we have been uh, hearing from other speakers as well. Um, I, 
I now would like to call on um, Dr. Shahidul Alam uh, to tell us a little bit on this relationship between protection of human rights defenders and the preservation of democracy in the South Asian context. We keep saying, you know, democracy is linked to our protection and uh, for preserving the space for us to work. So can you draw some, some give us some examples of how this in, in fact can be understood by the people? And how do we ensure the protection of human rights defenders and, and what kind of partnerships do you think would be necessary to create the mechanisms for this protection? Uh, Dr. Dr. Shahidul Alam. Thank you, Hina, uh, and thank you, Sarah. I've got a tough act to follow with the brilliant speakers before me. Uh, the question is complex because uh, the relationship is complex, um, while it is seen as very simplistic in some ways, uh, because uh, they are complex terms. We, we tend to see human rights from our own perspective without generally considering the rights of others. Uh, when it comes to democracy, uh, it's often been seen or, or presented as being merely the will of the majority. I, I see it more as the right of the governed to have a say in the process of governance. In that sense, democracy is also a right, but one that relates to rights of the population rather than the rights of the individual, though they are related. Uh, so certainly they both relate to rights. But if uh, majority decisions reduce the right of a minority, then the outcome of a democratic process might well impinge on individual rights. And that's where some of the problems come in. Uh, but if we return to the basic values of the rights of the governed, uh, then we're collectively addressing the rights of individuals. Uh, the democratic process should work for, theoretically, the greater good of the community while also protecting the vulnerable. And that's, that's where the problem comes in, because uh, often the greater good of the community is seen as a singular right of the majority, and protecting the vulnerable does not seem to come into it. I mean, it's the democratic process, the way we run it, first past the post, creates a situation where those who've gone past the post, whatever the mechanism might be, are the ones who decide. Now, individual rights do not change with changes of demography. Uh, but the democratic process is deeply rooted in, the, in demographics. <clears throat> and this is simply because we use it as a good indicator of determining the will of the people, which in a broad sense might be right. Uh, but the mechanism of the process, it, it does vary between that and we know that uh, that doesn't always work out, but there is a difference between rights and entitlement, and I, I, I think that's one of the things we need to remember. And often, in when we talk about the rights, the entitlement, particularly the entitlement of others, uh, is something that's quickly swept away. Uh, in my country, and I suspect in in our other countries, <clears throat> the difficulty is that. Uh, the institutions, the very state institutions which were meant to be supporting these values, these structures, have been decimated. Uh, I mean, we talk about the separation between the judiciary and the executive. That is long gone. I mean, we, certainly in our case, we have extreme examples where the judiciary can no longer perform the way it did. Uh, the police has become an extension of the government ruling party. Uh, there are many, many instances where really decisions that are being made by institutions or the role that is being played by institutions is so partisan that state interests and certainly people interests do not come into it. And that, of course, makes it very difficult. And for me, one issue which hasn't been addressed is uh, that in destroying institutions, one of the things they've also destroyed is the education system. You know, we had a system whereby uh, teachers were selected on, on merit. Today, it's not just teachers at every level. 
people are selected on the basis of party loyalty. And that is, in fact, the only thing uh, that determines who gets into a position. Uh, and that, that, I think, is a hugely damaging situation. We might well be able to recover from the other damages that have happened. But once an education system of a country is demolished, uh, it will take us a huge amount of time. And within that, there are specific areas of academic practice, which are particularly uh, problematic and particularly jeopardized. One of them is history. We've now come to a system where we can no longer practice history because history has been uh, prescribed for us. You cannot question certain uh, sanctimonious values that have been laid down through which uh, certain leaders are sacrosanct, uh, certain figures cannot be questioned, uh, a whole segment of political history cannot be de debated, uh, and it is sedition to be able to do that. So, I mean, the, the very practice of history has disappeared uh, from our textbooks. Uh, you know, you can only regurgitate the government version, and that, that makes it very problematic. Uh, of course, along with that uh, is this diversity. I mean, we've, we've talked about majoritarianism, Hindu majority in India, Muslim majority in Pakistan and Bangladesh, Buddhist majority in uh, Sri Lanka. But with all of those, e each of our country is very diverse. And we've come to a very unusual situation. I mean, if you look at the birth of Bangladesh, it was born on the basis of our demand to speak our own language. You know, we were being told to speak Urdu, we protested, we were the majority, and of course there was the repression we know of the genocide. I'm not going to go into that. But here within Bangladesh, we deny the rights of the Baharis, the indigenous people, to write their, to speak their language. And there is even 50 years after independence, there's military occupation of the Chittagong Hill Tracks. Uh, and there is what is close to genocide in, uh, in the Hill Tracks and you know, the land grabbing and everything else that goes on. So the rights of the minorities are being threatened. But let's look at all of those sort of things. What are the things that have really been destroyed? Freedom of speech, gone completely. Uh, media freedom no longer exists. Um, the right to associate. That again, and now, of course, with COVID, it, it becomes another problem. Religious freedom, um, we, because of the majority and because of the increasing dominance of extremist notions of Islam, that has become problematic. Sexual freedom, again, and perhaps the most difficult one, the right to dissent. That simply cannot happen now. I mean, COVID is a very good example. When there was uh, so much corruption going on, journalists who reported on relief goods for poor people being taken away by politicians and higher ups in the political echelon were put in jail because they reported on government corruption. And now we've got a ridiculous situation where you can, there's a de decree that you can no longer criticize the government unless you have the government's permission. What a bizarre situation we, we've come across. Uh, but, you know, I, I think Indra also talked about the fifth um, estate. I'm actually worried not only about the fifth estate, but also the fourth estate, because we now have a very serious situation where the fourth estate no longer performs the function that it used to do. Um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a photographer, so I, I use visual examples. And I, I remember the huge banners outside the press club, dangling outside the press club, which uh, pledged loyalty to the prime minister because, of course, she had given a grant of 20 crore uh, to, to the press. So the press can be appeased and is appeased, and they know which way to go. But now, we, our mainstream media has to a very, very large extent become, with important exceptions, become extensions of the government propaganda machinery. And that makes it very difficult for the rest of us. So we move to social media because we don't have a choice. 
And then, of course, you had the Draconian uh, Digital Security Act, which, uh, which of course, uh, puts you in jail if you warrant, and they can arrest you with that warrant, and you, you could spend as, at the moment, there is this case against me, so if convicted, I face 14 years in prison, because I dissented, I critiqued. Uh, and those are the things that come in. But others have also talked of um, factors which I'd like to bring in. I mean, we were talking about technology. Indra talked about the use of technology. Now, Drick, the organization I work with, we introduced email to Bangladesh in the early 90s, not because we are a technology company, but we saw what email could do, what internet could do in terms of the democratic process. But today, that has been usurped. And the government control of the internet is so acute and extreme. In fact, the technology is now used for surveillance. Uh, I no longer use a mobile phone. It's not safe for me to do so. Uh, and I know when Bangladesh should get together, the first thing they do is put away their mobile phones because they're not going to be trapped, tracked and followed and all those sort of things. I, I will bring in some other aspects. One, of course, is still to do with media, which is today in a large number of publications, and it is commonly known that the military intelligence provides the headlines for the reports that they do give. And they need consent from military intelligence before publishing news. Military intelligence decides who will appear in a talk show and what they're allowed to talk about and things like that. So. Uh, and we have a ridiculous situation, of course. Uh, I, I think it's no secret that our elections took place on the 29th of December 2018 as opposed to the 30th of December. Uh, and we know how it panned out. But we have our election commissioner who made this comment after the US elections that uh, the US should be learning from Bangladesh in terms of democracy. Perhaps he's right because, you know, um, had they learned from Bangladesh, they wouldn't, Trump would never have left. He would not have had to worry about votes being counted. Um, so uh, there is, a, a, you know, <laughs> there is a humor in there somewhere. But I, I will bring in some other issues again, which I don't think have been brought up. Brought up. I'm also very critical of the role of foreign governments. Uh, they will espouse democracy. They will talk about freedom, but yet these very governments are perfectly happy to put up with a pliant dictator. Of course, that's not just true with Bangladesh, that's true across the globe. But a pliant dictator is so much better to deal with, to do business with. And as long as my government deals with the Rohingya issue, as long as it deals with this you know, mis mislabeled war on terror, a few human rights dis uh, in imperfections within the country are okay. Let's not worry about those things. We are being provided, you know, our agenda be, is being served. And I, I would like to ask very hard questions of these organizations that wax lyrical about freedom and democracy, where they have a very different set of values when, when it applies to us. So now, but let me talk of very specific things. Again, one of the things which hasn't so much been dealt with is corporate interest. We happen to have, as most of our countries do, I'm sure, but in, in Bangladesh, the majority of the parliamentarians are co corporate people, they're business people. Uh, so when it comes to the garment workers, when it comes to their rights, the migrant workers and things like that, obviously it is the interest of the corporations that take place. We've got a situation where uh, the testing kit which was available and cheap and supposedly good in Bangladesh was never allowed because of the interest of um, the, the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, and of course, it's worthwhile knowing that the pharmaceutical head of one of the large pharmaceutical industries is the business advisor to the government. So you, you've got that nexus coming in. But let me talk about some things that, things that are happening now. Last night, the government, uh, the police um, attacked garment workers who were who were laying vigil outside the press club. They, the Tazreen fashions um, fire had taken place in 2012. It's been eight years and the case is still ongoing. Of the last three deferments, two have taken place because the judge wasn't there. 
One, because of the four, in fact, one, because the witness was introduced and one because of COVID. So this case continues and keeps going on because there is no political will to, to deal with it because most, uh, uh, certainly a large number of parliamentarians are also garment owners themselves. You've got a situation where a woman was gang raped after the election because she was perceived to have voted for the opposition party. Uh, Felani, um, the Bangladeshi uh, child, I would say, who was found dangling on the border, is someone our government never defended. And uh, I will bring in, I mean, we've talked about regionalization, but I will actually use this opportunity to talk about something that happens the other way around. Uh, we know within the subcontinental history, the role that India and Pakistan played in 1971. Uh, and certainly India played a very important role in the liberation of Bangladesh. Pakistan, we know, was the perpetrator of the genocide. Yet today, 50 years later, if we had a cricket match between India and Pakistan, the Bangladesh population would probably even be divided. And that's bizarre when you consider the history of these countries and that India has lost so much goodwill in such a short time through its big brotherly attitude with all its neighbors is something that I think my colleagues in India really need to bring up, uh, talk about because I talked to Filani, the border killings that go on in Bangladesh and, and are allowed to go on is, is something that simply cannot happen in human rights terms. Yet this is not something where Bangladeshi human rights defenders and Indian human rights defenders are working together. And I think that that's the sort of thing that really needs to happen uh, across, the, uh, across the board. I mean, uh, the Human Rights Commission is a joke uh, in my country, as it is in most other countries. Uh, we've also got a situation where uh, reporters, there's a, a photographer who used to work with us before, who was disappeared and is in jail today because he reported on a sex scandal where uh, ruling party politicians were involved. The, the jail is full of people, of political dissidents who have in some way spoken out. And I think given that situation, we need obviously to find ways out of it. But I will not end with just gloom. Uh, I, I do want to talk about hope itself. And yeah, I will say I'm sure we all need to hear more about hope, but you know, I can only give you a very little time for that uh, because we are running out of time. Well, uh, I will end with that. I, I think um, it was mentioned, but I, I was arrested. I spent over a hun uh, around 107 days in jail. The reason I believe I'm out is because Bangladeshis and people across the globe certainly people in India and in Pakistan and Sri Lanka rallied for me in, in, at such a level that it was untenable for the government to keep me in jail. And I think while that is the case, while we can work in solidarity, while we continue to look at our common interests, we will have a future. And I will end with just one anecdote because before uh, this thing happened, I was known in professional circles. I wasn't known in, by the general public. After I came out because of the incident, I, I got better known. And as I come out of the office, there's a young woman with a baby who comes to me, approaches me and says, can you bless my child? I want him to grow up to be as brave as you. And the common person in Bangladesh still believes, still has hope and still fights. And I think while that is the case, we must not give up hope. Certainly, I <clears throat> totally agree with you. And I also agree with you on this whole question of solidarity. I think, um, at least in my life, the only source of security for me was never whether uh, I was a UN special representative or anything else, but because of the human rights community around me that I felt secure. And I'm sure that's the case with all of us. Uh, I'm amazed every time we have these kind of discussions to see how common our problems are throughout the region, <clears throat> but also amazed by, by our governments who don't agree on anything, but are so enthusiastic in following all the negative trends. And to the dot, I mean, they follow it to the dot, even in details, things are similar. 
So, um, Dr. Shahidul Alam, I'm, I tell you, uh, your whole thing about hope is, is uh, what is most important. And I hope that our next step that Sahar will be ahead again would be to sit down together, find the pressure points that we can use for change and the leverage uh, that we may have with certain institutions to bring the pressure on our governments. So these are some of the things I think we need to put our heads together and brainstorm about. I, I'm handing over to Dikshya now to indicate to me whether we have time for question and answer. People have been very patient and I'm sure that uh, it would be very 